Hello and welcome. This is part two of the virtual tour of Bennington Battlefield. This is going to be a shorter installment. Uh, we are going to cover a couple, I guess what you might call tertiary positions. Um, in other words, not one of the big three that we uh, typically consider. Um, these positions are our Chaucer position, and we'll define that term momentarily, and uh, the baggage position. So we'll begin uh, first with our Chaucer position. And I'm going to bring up our Durnford map in sort of a, a, a less, less of a transparent mode, just so you can see clearly uh, what we're dealing with here. Um, we have a small little post here, labeled by Durnford, on the hillside, almost on the foot of the hill, at the junction of a short creek and the Willumsack River, here mistakenly labeled as uh, the Hoosick. Um, this river, you'll note, the course of the river, looks a lot different than it does today. Um, whereas Durnford has it sort of closer to the foot of uh, the hill, uh, today it takes sort of a more bowed um, position. And that's presumably uh, just a result of its course uh, wandering over, you know, about two and a half centuries here. So we don't think Durnford uh, made an error here, and uh, certainly made an error in labeling the river, but uh, we don't think he made an error in uh, charting its course. This is probably how it uh, appeared at the time of the battle. Now... We have, we mentioned uh, this is a position known as the uh, Chaucer position, which is interesting. Uh, what exactly is a Chaucer? Well, it's a French term. Um, it's sort of uh, the closest translation would be light infantry, but even that still isn't, isn't giving you the whole story. Um, at Bennington, you know, the, uh, one of the main uh, focuses when you're discussing weaponry is on uh, muskets. Now, yes, there were, that was probably uh, the predominant uh, shoulder arm here. However, we do have a number of rifles uh, mixed in. Um, and it would appear that actually both uh, sides, both the American Patriot Militia as well as the Crown Forces had some uh, rifles between them. Um, for our Crown Forces, for our German friends here, um, the men who are posted here are sort of an interesting, uh, interesting mix. So we have some uh, riflemen or some Jaeger, but they are actually supplemented by uh, some men just simply armed with muskets. Now, why would that be? Why would you have, you know, why, why the mix? Well, there's a good reason. <laughs> um, the large caliber uh, rifles that these, uh, these Jaeger were armed with had some advantages, obviously, in range and some limitations. Um, once they are fired a few times, once they start to get fouled a little bit, it's significantly more difficult to get them loaded. Um, it's time consuming to load them. And that makes them kind of vulnerable. Um, if we go back to continental Europe, uh, during the Seven Years' War, we actually had uh, a combination of Russian and Austrian forces um, invading Prussia and actually taking Berlin uh, for a time. Um, and a result of a, a battle not far from Berlin um, sort of 
set the stage for this this mix of weaponry. Um, at this time, there was a concentration of Jaeger, and uh, they were basically left unprotected. They were not supplemented by uh, any kind of musketmen, and they were basically totally wiped out by Cossacks um, to the west of Berlin, near Spandau. Um, they were caught in the open, they were ridden down, and it made an impression on the Prussians. And so the Prussians took the measure of sort of creating these mixed units, um, which we believe were employed here. Um, so the musket men, no, they don't have the same range as the Jaeger. However, they have sort of a greater rate of fire. Um, the Jaeger here, in our case, also have sort of an interesting interesting weapon. Um, they can actually mount, this was not the case usually um, for a lot of men armed with rifles, um, but they could actually uh, basically mount a Hirschfanger um, as a bayonet on their rifle. So this made them a little more, a little tougher um, than just you know uh, your your standard uh, rifleman. So this would have obviously been a nice little spot for riflemen. Uh, you have a relatively high ground here. Uh, I can bring up our topographic map. Uh, you can see that we are still not on the river flats just yet here. If I hover over, I'm getting a the approximate location of this post, maybe 550 to 570 feet above sea level. So we've dropped a few hundred feet compared with the elevation of the uh, Hessian Hill. But it's still a very commanding position um, that would have had a view to some, uh, some cleared land here. Now, the Americans actually harassed this position before Stark's main... Um, enveloping maneuvers and we know this because we have uh, some comments that were made um, so specifically we're going to go back to Wasmus he talks about how Americans were firing on bombs left flank well okay let's go ahead we'll turn to face the Americans we'll pretend we're bomb here's our left flank so, it's an interesting comment. Where were they firing on this position from? Well, we're not going to get into specifics, but we will, we will simply say that there was a structure. Um, it's a, a fair distance from this point that the Americans um, basically used for cover uh, to lay down some fire on this, this position. Um, it's known to us only as the Widow Whipple House. We don't really know too much about poor Widow Whipple, um, except that after she was widowed, um, her property was involved in the Battle of Bennington, and uh, it came out somewhat worse for, for the wear here. Um, so after the Americans fire at the Chaucer position here, we have... Actually, the British uh, making an effort to turn them out of this uh, house. It's probably just a, a simple cabin. And then setting fire to it. So poor Widow Whipple, she actually had her, her home burnt down as a result of the battle here. Um, to be able to fire from the, uh, the assumed location of the Whipple house, again, we won't get into specifics, but we will say we're talking about a range that is uh, greater than uh, what you consider, um, you know, range for a musket. So that suggests that the Americans were possibly utilizing rifles to fire on that post, which is uh, borne out by some of the archaeological investigations we've done. Um, you find ammunition um, that it would be a pro an appropriate caliber for muskets 
pretty broadly distributed. And to us, that seems to suggest that, yes, some of the Americans were probably armed with muskets. Or, pardon me, rifles. So, it's an interesting uh, place. Um, our next stop is the baggage. I'll wait for Durnford to load. Again, this, this overlay is not 100% accurate. There's some debate as to the bounds of our uh, baggage field here. But uh, you'll see that it's basically a small open field carved into what is otherwise the solid old growth of the hillside here. Now, why would you need to have the baggage in the field? Well, um, when we're talking about baggage, you know, specifically we're talking about um, items that are not being carried on a soldier's person. And so that, that can encompass a wide variety of uh, different things. In our case, in addition to perhaps uh, knapsacks, things of that nature, uh, no tents, um, we have a living <laughs> menagerie um, sort of uh, attached to Baum's force. He's got to, remember, pursuant to his orders, he's got to be gathering horses, he's got to be gathering oxen, things of that nature. So they are going to be closely guarded. This, If you consider, you know, the location here, here's our Dragoon Redoubt, here's our uh, Chaucer position, here's Bomb's Overlook, which we haven't covered yet. Um, it's really got a nice protective uh, ring around it. So this is a safe spot for all these, uh, these uh, different items and livestock. Um, it's also presumably a pasture. Um, there, this wasn't you know, a cornfield, as far as we can tell, or anything like that. This was probably a, uh, a pasture. It's well watered. There is a spring in this area. Um, so this would be an ideal location for uh, watering horses or watering oxen. Now, what kind of numbers are we talking here? Well, you know, we can't get exact, so we're uh, we're never going to have an exact count of, you know, the things as they stood hour to hour. Um, but we do know that on the 16th in the morning, uh, Wasmus relates that 100 oxen were sent into the army. Uh, he goes on to say everything is quiet. We neither see nor hear anything of the enemy. And the patrols that were sent out have not seen anything of the enemy as far as one hour's march away. So this is the calm before the storm, right? He goes on to relate, This morning we took possession of many other horses, all non-commissioned officers of the regiment, and several dragoons in each squadron have horses. If this continues, the regiment will soon be mounted. So we have a count for the oxen, 100 plus whatever bomb was already sitting on, and we have a hint that there are a great number of horses that have been collected. Um, so this baggage uh, is probably looking pretty full. Um, it's going to be guarded. And we can actually, we're going to have to go a little ways on our map to uh, get to Durnford's key here. Um, but you'll notice that it's guarded by... Again, these are not structures, these are uh, bodies of men. Um, it's guarded by both American volunteers, and by that, Durnford means loyalists, as well as German grenadiers. So, this is not a lightly uh, defended position. Um, this is, you know, grenadiers obviously are uh, some of the most capable uh, men under Baum's command. Uh, they're there probably to stiffen the provincials, uh, the loyalists. But this position, this post does not hold out uh, terribly long. Um, it's worth mentioning, a little later on, we'll be investigating uh, the Tory Fort right here. 
Um, when we talk about a lot of the stories um, that come down to us about the loyalists who fought in the battle, um, there's not always a clear uh, point of reference to tie their narrative to on uh, the battlefield. So it's perfectly possible, and in some historians' minds likely, that uh, men like uh, John Peters, who commanded the Queen's uh, Loyal Rangers, might actually have been posted in the baggage chair, <laughs> rather than uh, over here at the Tory Fort, which is interesting to consider that some of the, you know, potentially some of the heart-wrenching uh, accounts of neighbor against neighbor um, fighting that we get uh, might have actually occurred in this location because we do have a body of loyalists here. Um, but more on that later. Uh, so that's going to uh, conclude today's video. As I said, it was fairly brief, but we have now covered pretty much the entirety of the hill and the hillside now. So we'll be moving on to uh, the center of the battlefield next. As always, if you have any uh, questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. Thank you very much.